Thank you all. Pleasure to be here with you today and talk to you about the work that my lab and uh, fellow members of the T2T consortium have been doing. Um, over the past about five years, most of this work happened uh, in the midst of the pandemic in our basements, in our kitchens, in our living rooms. Um, and uh, it's just an honor to share the work of these people with you today. Um, we have a, a wide audience ranging from Todd's daughters <laughs> to more senior members of the faculty. So we'll try to have a little something for everyone in this. Um, and I had this slide in here because I wanted to start it off with a bit of a fun note because I thought we might have a diverse audience of some non-genomics people, some CS people. I wasn't expecting the primary schoolers, but this will be interesting to them too maybe. And it's just to drive home this point that the scale of genomic data boggles my mind, even though I've been thinking about it for 20 years, and it's truly astronomical. So if you actually do the math of how much DNA is in your body, and we use a rough estimate of three trillion nucleated cells in your body, so that's cells of your body that actually have DNA in them, and in each of those cells is about six billion base pairs, individual letters of DNA, and each of those base pairs, if you kind of measure their height, in a strand is about three angstroms, which is really tiny. It's like a millionth of a hair, I think. Um, but there's so many cells and there's so many bases that those numbers add up to 3.4 billion miles of DNA if you stretched it out end to end in your body right now that would reach to Pluto. And that's just like, math doesn't lie. These are the numbers, but that just doesn't make sense to me that you could line up enough DNA in your body right now from here to Pluto. It's just astronomical, truly, in the sense of the word. Um, and it also is a testament to how well that DNA is packed <laughs> inside of each of your cells. Obviously, it's not straight. It's all tight, tightly wound and packed inside of each of your cells, but it's a tremendous amount. Add on 8 billion people on Earth, that's 4.6 million light years of DNA on planet Earth, and that would reach to the Andromeda galaxy. And so these are just incredible numbers, and it makes it really fun as a computer scientist to do data analysis in a field that really has almost unlimited amounts of DNA. And I think the DNA sequencing companies should use this in their pitch decks because they're never gonna run out of DNA to sequence on the planet Earth. This is just humans. If you consider viruses, it's at least an order of magnitude higher in terms of that, let alone bacteria and all the other fauna on Earth. So, when the Human Genome Project was launched, it had the much more um, practical goal of sequencing a single human genome, which six billion base is about one meter of DNA. It was launched in 1990. Uh, it was marked as completed in 2003 with great fanfare announced at the White House. And you can see in this slide here, decoding the book of life. It was really held up as this quote unquote milestone for humanity. And it was a tremendous resource and has gone on to just grow this field exponentially for the last 20 years as showing what was possible. And so we're at a 20 year anniversary. That genome project was announced complete and the funding wound down in 2003. And so this marks the 20th year of the completion of the Human Genome Project. But there was a couple of key caveats that were mentioned in the paper to the credit of the International Consortium but that weren't always translated in the press releases and the common press coverage of this, that the genome that was completed is the euchromatic fraction of the genome. And in fact, there was 341 gaps as they admitted to in this paper. And they have this nice sentence that many of the remaining gaps are associated with segmental duplications and will require focused work with new methods. Enter NHGRI 20 years later. This is exactly what we were working on in the T2T project. So what's the difference between euchromatin and heterochromatin? Um, very roughly speaking, we talked about DNA being well packed in your cells. And the rough analogy is that the heterochromatin is the very densely, tightly packed DNA. The euchromatin is more open and actually expressing genes. So by doing the euchromatic fraction of the genome, they got nearly all of the genes, but they missed this last 10% um, that also plays important functional roles in the genome, which is the heterochromatin. And the reason it wasn't finished is very simply because um, they had small pieces and you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, genome assembly is you fragment the genome up into a bunch of tiny pieces and you try to stitch them back together again. The sequences at the time were maybe 300 to 500 base pairs in length and those sequences just weren't big enough to reconstruct the heterochromatin which is comprised 
of these highly repetitive sequences like Waldo in the picture here. And I like Waldo particularly because he has this striped white and red pattern. It reminds me a lot of the so-called satellite repeats in the human genome, which are tandemly repeating sequences of DNA, sometimes repeated for millions of base pairs. And the original Human Genome Project literally just pushed all of those to the side and left them in a big heap and reconstructed the interesting bits of the genome that were unique um, and left all of this for later because we just didn't have the sequencing technology at the time um, to get through it. So what's the solution? You have this literally uh, maybe 100 million piece jigsaw puzzle and you can't put all of the pieces back together. Um, we had a very obvious solution of just making the pieces bigger. And if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and you're given the Dora puzzle, it's a lot easier than 100 million pieces. And so we really relied on advances of sequencing technology for the past 20 years to give us much longer pieces of DNA than we could do at the outset of the Human Genome Project. And this has really happened just within the last decade or so. And so we've entered this so-called long read sequencing era in the last 10 years where we can now sequence individual molecules of DNA up to a million bases in length. And so the nanopore sequencing technology is what really got me excited about the prospect of finishing the human genome. And no coincidence, it came out right around the time that I left for NHGRI, because we saw that technology capable of reading million base pair fragments of DNA, and this makes the jigsaw puzzle much, much easier than trying to do it from a few hundred bases of DNA. And the dimensions of nanopore sequencing, just like the dimensions of the DNA in your body, are similarly mind-blowing. If you scale up the nanopore to the size of my fist, Doing a million base pair read is like threading three kilometers of rope through your fist at 400 bases a second and accurately reading off every base that passes through there with 99% accuracy. And that's what we can do uh, today with the state of the art nanopore sequencing, and that's incredible. So how does this work? Well, cue computer science. All of the sequencing advances that we've seen have come hand in hand with advances in other fields, namely computer science, and in this case, electrical engineering, protein engineering, really spanning every field of engineering you can imagine packaged into one of these nanopore sequencers. And they've repurposed, um, in the original technology, an E. coli membrane protein that's used for shuttling things in and out of the E. coli cell membrane, <coughs> and have figured out a way to thread a single strand of DNA down through that protein nanopore that's embedded in this um, membrane. So you've got a solid membrane, single pore, single strand of DNA goes through it, you apply a voltage across that membrane and it drives the negatively charged DNA through the pore. And that motion is regulated by a motor protein at the top that makes the uh, DNA strand go through in a stepwise fashion. So if you didn't have that protein at the top regulating it, it would go through so fast you couldn't really read the bases. That really slows it down and puts it through at a regular motion. And then you simply read off the current going through that pore over time measured in tiny, tiny amounts of picoamps over time. And again, about 400 bases per second is the speed of that DNA through the pore. And you get a plot that looks like this, where you can squint and kind of see horizontal lines, and let's call those events, where an event means the nanopore ratcheted the DNA down one base. And each of those levels represents the set of bases that are present in that pore, so maybe anywhere from five to 10 bases that are affecting the signal, um, the current going through that pore at any particular point in time. And our problem is to look at that amp readout at this unit of time and predict the bases that were in the pore. So how do you do that? Machine learning. <laughs> you put a bunch of known sequence through the pore and you measure the current readout of the sequence that you know is going through there and you match that up with different k-mers, little words of DNA and you become to predict what current level I expect to see based on the camera that's in the pore at a particular time. The first step is to kind of label those events and so segment it into areas of kind of uniform uh, amperage. You train all of that data. Currently, the nanopore base callers use a recurrent neural network style architecture on known bases of, say, the human genome, the E. coli genome, and so forth. And then the machine learning predicts for every event that we saw in the input, the bases that were in the pore at that particular moment in time. And this works currently with about a 98, 99% accuracy of the bases at a single molecule level and resolution, which is just really astounding. 
So with that technology in hand, both from the computational side to do the base calling and the engineering side to actually thread those nanopores, um, my colleague Karen Mega and I founded this telomere to telomere consortium in 2018 to just throw as much data at the problem as we could using this new technology and try to finish these remaining gaps in the human genome. And again, um, recurring theme of my research strategy is to do obvious things and do it well. Um, and so we made the pieces bigger and our next strategy was just collect a lot of those big pieces and see what we could do. Again, uh, aided by the technology advancements, the Sanger-based sequencing tech that was being used in the 1990s required almost factories of DNA sequencers where you just had entire rooms full of old ABI instruments that were doing capillary-based sequencing. This has now been replaced by a single instrument and a single technician. So this is Shalise Brooks at the NHGRI, ran this single instrument by herself over the course of like six months to collect the data from this project um, for our Oxford nanopore sequencing. And for the kids, since this is um, a nanopore uh, and these little devices are called min-ion sequencers, the device is named Gru and these are his little min-ions that he's controlling. <laughs> Um, but what do we do with that data once we collected all of those ultra-long reads? And this is where uh, two of my postdocs at the time, Miko Rautiainen and Sergey Nurk, became key players of this project, that they took what we call genome assembly graphs that were built with some of the available technology at the time, and this was using PacBio HiFi. And these graphs are representing the DNA. So each of these little colored noodles, imagine as a strand of DNA, but anytime it doesn't look linear and it's tangled into these knots, it's where there's ambiguity caused by the repeats, like the satellites and so forth. And we don't know which piece of DNA comes after which other piece because it's repetitive, and we represent that ambiguity as different paths in the graph. So if we zoom in on one of those, which is near the centromere of chromosome two in the human genome, we see a structure like this, where again, each of these nodes is a piece of DNA, and the graph is representing their adjacencies to one another, but we can't tell exactly how to walk through this graph to resolve this tangle. Well, if we come along with these million base pair nanopore reads and we align them to those graphs, they spell out the paths for us. So for instance, in red here are our nanopore reads and they say I should go from this node to this node to this node, for instance. And if you simply use those nanopore reads to infer an ordering of the nodes, you can put numbers on each of these and you just follow by number a path through that graph and that unrolls these tangles into a single contiguous piece of DNA with no gaps and no ambiguity. And this is how we finished the T to T genome by applying nanopore reads to all of these complex regions, untangling these knots in the assembly graph and generating this final contiguous sequence. So if we look at the genome in 2003 when it was announced finished versus what it looks like today in the CHM13 reference, you can see obviously that we reduced the number of gaps down to zero but what's also impressive is that the accuracy went up by two orders of magnitude. So we went from one error per 100,000 bases to one error per approximately 10 million bases now. So fewer gaps, two orders of magnitude more accurate, and the cost went from $5 billion for the Human Genome Project down to about $10,000 of reagents if you were to repeat this project today. And if you wanted to replicate kind of the quality of this genome, you could do it for well under $5,000 today. And so we're talking about a million fold reduction in cost over the past 20 years, which is pretty astounding. So the title of the talk, what's new? We went through all of this trouble. We waited 20 years. What did we find? Um, it comes down to kind of two classes of elements in the genome, which we'll call segdupes and satellites. So I mentioned satellites. These are the tandem repeats in the genome, and that's very simply how they're defined. It's just a bit of sequence that tandemly repeats over and over again in the genome. And the segdupes are roughly defined as non-satellite sequence that's duplicated en masse. So imagine you copy paste a few megabases of sequence somewhere else in the genome. These are what the segdupes are. Those come along with all of the genes in that original bit of sequence, get copied over to somewhere else as paralogs. About three quarters of the sequence is satellites and about a quarter of it is segmental duplications, including um, the RDNA duplications, which are the RNA genes for your ribosomes. Ribosomes obviously very important for the cellular function. And you can see on this graph in red, all of the new sequence that was uncovered in the human genome by this project. 
and most of it localizes to the middle of the chromosomes, these are the centromeres, and to the short arms of the five acrocentric chromosomes, these are the chromosomes in the human genome where the centromere is pushed further to one side than the other. And all of these segdupes and satellites, well I shouldn't say all, but a majority of them are enriched specifically around the centromeres, the telomeres, and the short arms of the acrocentrics. To just show kind of the improvement of resolution going from the older reference to the newer reference, this is a plot showing the segmental duplications in the HG38 reference and the new T to T CHM13 reference. Each of these little red lines is connecting the chromosomes, which are around the outside, with a line if you have a highly similar segmental duplication between two different chromosomes. And you can just see a really big increase in mass. There's a lot more segmental duplications represented in this T to T reference. And if you look a little closer, you'll see some chromosomes are a little more responsible for that than the others. And again, it's these acrocentric chromosomes of 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22. The majority of those new segmental duplications are localized on the short arms of those acrocentric chromosomes. So this is a little bit in the weeds, but I want to kind of walk you through what's on the short arms of these acrocentrics. And really, it's nothing but segdupes and satellites in these regions. In fact, if you look at the short arms of the acrocentrics and you look at all five KB windows, there's not a single window in there that's unique in the genome at 80% identity. It's all duplications. And that's exactly why they weren't finished by the first Human Genome Project, because again, we were troubled by these repeats. The long reads help us resolve them. So basic biology of the human genome, these are what the acrocentric chromosomes look like. If you look down a microscope and you specifically paint in pink the RDNA arrays. And you can see that the RDNA arrays are all on the short arm. They vary in copy number between different chromosomes and sometimes even between uh, the two haplotypes of the same chromosome. These numbers represent the copies of RDNAs that you have. And in any particular cell, maybe 300 to 500 copies of these RDNA units. And they're again arranged in these large tandem arrays and within them are the RNA genes that code for the RNA component of your ribosome. So the ribosomes are this molecular complex of both proteins and RNAs, and this is one of the RNA components coded in these regions. And so ribosomes are obviously super important because they make all of the proteins in your body, but they've been understudied in genomics as a result of them being very repetitive. So we can finally start to understand the organization of these regions. And each of the short arms in the human genome follow this similar pattern in the so-called nucleolar organizer region. The nucleolus is the region within the nucleus where the ribosomes are being produced. And the chromosomes that are involved in this process have a distal satellite region, the RDNA genes, and then this proximal satellite region. But for the last few decades, all we could do is look down the microscope at these, and we didn't understand the actual base pairs that were involved in these regions. So now we do. What do they look like? They're this really cool mosaic of segmental duplications and satellites. And so in this diagram, anything that's in a color is a satellite sequence of a different class based on the color. And the gray are the segmental duplications or the non-satellites. The genes um, are annotated above here in pink and green. And you can see that the genes are always in the segdupes and the satellites themselves are relatively gene free. This is the RDNA array here in this particular chromosome 14. There's 16 copies. This is the telomere on the left and the centromere on the right. And so this is kind of the distal satellite, RDNA proximal satellite. If we then line up the four other acrocentric short arms against this one and plot their similarity, you get this heat map where the darker colors are more similar and the lighter colors are less similar. And we start to see some structures emerge. The first being that on the distal side, the satellites between all five of the acrocentrics generally share the same structure. The same classes of satellites are on there and they generally have a decent sequence similarity. The RDNA arrays are all highly similar, so well above 99% identity between all of the RDNA units. And that similarity extends a few megabases on the distal side and the proximal side. Then you have some additional satellites that aren't as well conserved as the distal ones. 
Um, but then surprisingly, we found this very long, highly conserved segmental duplication that was shared specifically between chromosomes 13, 14, and 21. And there was also some past cytogenetic evidence that, for instance, the centromeres of certain chromosome pairs like 14 and 22 were similar. We confirmed that, and you can see chromosome 14 shows a higher degree of similarity to chromosome 22 than the other three. But it was really this segdupe in the middle that surprised me the most, both because of its size and because of the very high degree of similarity. So the similarity between these three different chromosomes is well above 99%. And it's similar at the level of human haplotypes. So for instance, all of your chromosomes are present in your body in two pairs, well, one pair of two copies, one inherited from your mom, one inherited from your dad. And those tend to be you know, around 99.9% .9 similar. These segdupes are as similar as your chromosome pairs, which was a bit surprising to us. And outside of the RDNAs, this is one of the only regions in the human genome where we see this high degree of conservation. And it led us to this really interesting hypothesis that there's active recombination happening between heterologous chromosomes in these regions. It explains both the degree of similarity that we see in there, that they're recombining. And when we look at population data from many, many humans, we see patterns, expected patterns of recombination in these regions. And so we've turned them pseudo-homologous regions, kind of as a play, if you're familiar with sex chromosome biology, there's a pseudo-autosomal region that still actively recombines between the X and Y chromosomes. This is active recombination between different autosomes. So pseudo-homologous regions. The reasons that this makes sense is that we know all of the acrocentrics co-localize in the nucleolus, and now we know that we have these very high degree of similarity between them. So they're in the same location of the nucleus. They have very high sequence similarity. They will be prone to recombination, and we see evidence for not just recombination and kind of the accidental sense, but almost programmed recombination in meiotic crossovers. And so this would be a mispairing or an intentional pairing, depending on how you see it, of chromosomes, in this case 13 and 21, that share this large three megabase PHR region. There would be a meiotic crossover, crossover event that happens between 13 and 21, which is swapping the distal bit of 21 onto 13 and vice versa. And this would be totally benign if this happened because the only things that happen um, on those short arms, uh, the only thing that's contained on there really is the RDNA arrays and the associated nucleolar organizer region. And it looks like that's not necessarily chromosome specific. Any one of those distal bits could be swapped for any of the other distal bits. But there's an interesting consequence if you have a different chromosomal pairing. So that large pseudo-homologous region on chromosome 14 was inverted relative to the region on 13 and 21. So if you pair now accidentally 13 and 14 together, they're in this flipped orientation, and the crossover will have the effect of sticking those two chromosomes together head to head and making a Robertsonian translocation, which reduces the chromosome count um, in the resulting cell. This tiny little bit that has the two RDNA arrays on is eventually lost after a couple rounds of cell division, but this larger translocation persists and exists. And these are known and have been known for as long as cytogenetics in humans has been going on basically, and they're the most common translocation in humans. So about one in a thousand births is the current estimated frequency of this, and they're relatively benign. If you have a Robertsonian chromosome, you're a happy, walking, breathing human, it elevates the risk that your offspring will have trisomies, and there might be other yet undiscovered uh, phenotypes associated with this. But it's always been assumed that these translocations were happening either in the RDNAs or the centromeres, but this analysis is showing that it's happening more frequently in these pseudo-homologous regions, and it's mediated by this inverted segdupe and gives this very nice and clean mechanism for the formation of these ROBs in human. So a really nice finding from the combination of having a T to T genome as well as these more population um, survey data from larger human populations. And this is work with Eric Garrison, um, University of Tennessee, and Jen Gerton at Stowers Institute in Kansas City. A little more evidence that this is intentional by the genome rather than accidental is that if you survey the frequency of PRDM9 binding motif, so this is a zinc finger that causes double-stranded breaks to encourage meiotic recombination 
and you see enriched around recombination hotspots in the human genome, the rDNA just lights up for these binding motifs. So the rDNAs are encouraging recombination to help preserve their sequence identity across these five different chromosomes. And we also see a peak, interestingly enough, at this SST1 satellite region, which is directly in the center of these pseudohomologous regions. Um, a little less clear why the genome might want to recombine at that point. Um, and so we're following up to see, are there any genes surrounding this region that seem to have some important function that might be um, important uh, to recombine as well as the RDNAs. So future work, we're sequencing a bunch of Robertsonian cell lines now to better understand the biology behind this. So a couple of interesting conclusions from this finding about why the RDNAs are on the acrocentric chromosomes in human. And across multiple species, if you ask where do the RDNAs live in the genome, you'll either find them in one array, or if they're in multiple arrays, they'll always be towards the short arms or towards the telomere of a chromosome. And if you think about these meiotic crossover events, this makes sense because this allows the crossovers to be basically benign. The only things that are being swapped are the RDNA arrays, and you're not swapping huge arrays of other genes. Imagine if you had an RDNA array in the middle of a very large chromosome and you had this crossover, you'd be swapping the long arms of two chromosomes and that translocation might have a negative effect. By keeping them at the ends, these crossovers are only swapping the RDNAs and nothing else. And I think this is what's facilitating this concerted evolution between the 10 different RDNA copies in a diploid human genome. So the consequence of this is that these nucleolar organizer regions in the human genome are not likely chromosome specific. That a certain allele in my genome might be on chromosome 13, but you might see, find that same allele on chromosome 21 in somebody else's genome, for instance. And this is a weird way to think about the genome because we've become very accustomed to talking about genes as their location at a single spot on a single reference genome. But if they're swapping around and switching chromosomes from time to time, this breaks that assumption and we have to rethink the way that we're cataloging variation within genomes. So um, raise your hand if you're in Todd's software engineering class. How many people came over? <laughs> all right, good. Todd, give all of these kids A's. There's five of them. Give your names to Professor Trang and after the, <laughs> the seminar. I promised you if you came, I would tell you why mapping might be obsolete. Um, it's not obsolete tomorrow. This is gonna keep happening for the next decade. But I want you to kind of understand the limitations of read mapping. And if you want a full characterization of the genome, why we need to invent better ways to characterize it. And it's precisely in these dynamic regions where it fails. So um, imagine that you're taking your reads and you're mapping them against the prior reference genome that had some gaps in it, all right? So each of the little reads, uh, the little arrows, are reads, the big arrows are genes, and the lightning bolts are a mutation that you're interested in because maybe it results in a disease. And so your patient comes into the clinic, gets sampled, and this is what the locus looks like. But if your reference genome is missing the second copy of that gene, all of the reads have nowhere to map, and so they pile up on the most similar region of the genome that they can find, and that's the first copy of the gene. And when variant callers see an unusually high depth of coverage or an unexpected pattern of variance, it'll just not call variance in that region because it's, it's not confident um, in the calls. And so this variant, which is causing the disease of the patient, will go uncalled in this analysis and you'll miss the association between that variant and the disease because there was gaps in the reference. So obvious solution, fill the gaps, the reads map to the right location, you call the variant, job done. This happens in real life. Um, the example that we gave in the T2T uh, paper was an analysis of this FRG1 paralogous gene family, where if you align all of your reads to HG38 and look at this particular locus on chromosome 20, all of these colorful little lines on this plot are false positive variant calls. So all of that, anywhere you see a color is a variant call, but all of those colors are false positives caused by reads mismapping to this locus because there's only nine copies of this uh, paralog represented in HG38, when in reality there's about 23 copies in any human genome. If instead you map all of the reads to the complete T to T reference that has all 23 paralogs, the reads have the correct places to align, 
and you clean up now all of these variants that you see. And these pileups are true positive variant calls from this correct paralog that you're trying to analyze. And so by aligning to a complete reference, you get reads mapping to the right locations and it solves a lot of these problems. And Fritz and others um, have characterized some of the challenging regions of the human genome and there's some known medically relevant genes that fall into this category that are easier and cleaner to analyze when you're mapping to a complete reference genome as opposed to an incomplete reference genome. But there's other ways that mapping can go wrong, even if you have a complete genome. There's natural copy number variation in the human population. So imagine again, this kind of two copy gene situation, but now the reference genome that I've reconstructed is from a different individual and it has a single copy. The same effect happens and it's the same as having an incomplete genome, as having this non-representative genome. That those second copies have nowhere to go, they map onto the first copy and they confound the variant analysis. If only the reference was my genome as opposed to this random individual that was chosen in the Human Genome Project. Again, we know that this happens. There's regions of the genome that have a lot of allelic diversity in the human genome. To just give you a simple example that you should all be familiar with, I could have given an immune locus <laughs> to make Peter happy, but instead we'll talk about the RH blood group antigens, which I'm sure he also is interested in. Um, this is what gives you positive or negative blood, if you've ever had a blood type test, is the presence of this olive colored RHD gene in your genome. And if we look across now, this is about 50 individuals, so about 100 haplotypes, and their gene structures in this region, we can already see a lot of uh, diversity. At the bottom here, this individual has two copies of the RHD gene. The top, more frequent haplotype has a single copy. There's some inversion events. There's some gene conversion events. A lot of differences in this very common, very obviously medically relevant region of the genome. So think about that very simple example of you're coming into the clinic to have your genome analyzed and you have this rare two copy haplotype, it gets aligned to the reference that has a single haplotype, any variants in your RHD gene instantly go out the window and will fail to be characterized by analysis against a single reference genome. And lastly is uh, reference bias based on gene location rather than copy number. So often underappreciated is that genes can jump around the genome and change location by a process known as gene conversion, where you get recombination by two distant loci and it copies the sequence from one location to the other location. So imagine now that the first copy is a pseudogene, the second copy is the functional gene, but in the reference, the orientation, I'm sorry, the order is reversed and uh, the functional copy now is the first copy of this gene and you're now calling variants in the pseudogene, those might go um, unanalyzed and presumed to be in a pseudogene when in fact those are variants in the functional gene and they should be analyzed. It's a little more complex of a case, but this does happen. Um, an interesting example of it is from our recent completion of a human Y chromosome and this particular gene TSPY2, where when we first assembled our Y chromosome, we thought we had made a mistake because the location of TSPY2 moved from the beginning of the chromosome towards uh, a latter part of the chromosome. In particular, there's this TSPY gene array, which in this reference is about 44 copies, and TSPY2 jumped from upstream of it to downstream of it. And at first we thought this was a mistake in the assembly process, but we went in and looked at 43 additional Y chromosomes, and we found that no, about half of the Y haplogroups have it upstream, and about half of it have it downstream. Somewhere in the vast history, of human evolution, that gene jumped, and if you have a Y chromosome from that descendant of that jump, you have it downstream, otherwise you have it upstream. And this is a functional protein coding gene associated with spermatogenesis in males. So exactly uh, the case that I just described. And it's not just that gene, and it's not just the Y chromosome, there are starting to be examples of other genes not in the places we thought they were, this was a preprint that came out a few months ago analyzing the CHM13 genome for this particular WASH1 gene family. And the WASH1 paralogs localize in the telomeric regions of all of the chromosomes. All of those other copies are assumed to be pseudogenes, so not the protein coding functional genes. That was annotated previously on chromosome 9 as the functional copy. 
This paper argues that that functional copy is actually on chromosome 20, and we've been misled for the last 20 years of the location of this gene. But it raises the question, okay, maybe the functional copy in chromosome in CHM13 is on chromosome 20. I don't know, maybe in some other humans it's on chromosome 9. Uh, is this a mistake? Or is this an actual gene conversion event like the TSPY2 example? And it's possible that the subtelomeres are undergoing this kind of heterologous recombination like we saw in the short arms. We know this happens in organisms like yeast. Why couldn't it also be happening in human? To answer this question, we need to sequence many more humans with this T to T recipe and figure out how many, how many more cases uh, are like this of these genes in places different from where we thought they were. So, to summarize the current mapping-based approaches, we're finding in these new regions of the genome, which represent about 10% of the genome, the structural variation is rampant. And it's enriched around these segdupes and satellites, specifically because those sequences are so repetitive. They have so many highly similar sequences throughout the genome, they're enriched for these kind of odd recombination events. Furthermore, the satellites and these gene arrays evolve by different processes. So rather than like single site mutation, they have unequal crossing over events and other types of recombination that can delete big chunks of them at one time or expand big chunks of them at another time. And that's just a different evolutionary process that our current tools aren't super well suited to analyze. The segdupes in particular are gene rich and are prone to these types of gene conversion events. And it's known that these types of gene conversions uh, might have important roles to play in human adaptation. A lot of these paralogous gene families have expanded in humans relative to our grade eight uh, relatives. And so it's important to understand the function and evolutionary history of these paralogous gene families and any association they might have with disease. And then lastly, if you're mapping to a reference and the gene has moved, you've been looking at the wrong place. Um, and the location of the functional copy of the gene matters because it puts it in a different regulatory context, a different epigenetic context of the genome. So what's the solution? Um, and I don't think I can answer this in the you know, five or 10 minutes that I have left, but I'll tell you where I think the field is headed in the next 10 years. This isn't what you're going to kind of like deploy in the clinic uh, tomorrow, but maybe if you come back 10 years from now and see what we're talking about, uh, it might look something like this. So my first point is that you are your own best reference. If you're gonna map reads against a reference, they should be mapped against your genome rather than some random person's genome in the population because obviously we're all unique individuals. We all have unique genomes unless you have a twin and we should be mapping against our own reference. So you have a patient come into the clinic. Ultimately, you're asking, what is the diploid genome of this individual? And if you're answering that question by mapping them against a reference, you're doing an incomplete job. First off, if you're using HG38, you're only analyzing about 90% of the genome. Second off, if you're using short reads, they can only access about 90% of the genome. So even if you have a complete reference and you're assaying with short reads, you're not gonna see everything. You're calling variants, but it's an incomplete set of variants. The flip side though, is if you wanna do a T to T project for every patient, this is not feasible either. This is costly, both in terms of expertise and money and time. And so we're looking for some in between. And so my current pitch is this idea of genome inference as the in-between of de novo assembly and read mapping, where you're trying to infer the complete diploid genome of an individual using prior knowledge about what human genomes should look like based on population survey data. So it's like de novo assembly, but with prior information about what human structural variation looks like, and then trying to do inference, and maybe with lower coverage data or maybe even short read data predict the genome of this individual and how well can you do. That would allow us to scale this up to much higher numbers of patients. But there's a chicken and egg problem. You need that prior information of what human genomes look like to predict what the next human genome looks like. And we have to bootstrap that process by finishing a bunch of human genomes using this de novo process because we currently lack that prior information. So we need to build that up. We're trying to do that with the human pangenome project um, this is a consortium funded by my institute. And the goal of this project is very simply to sequence and complete telomere to telomere a nice set of human haplotypes from a diverse set of ancestries. Currently, we're targeting about 350 individuals, which would equate to about 700 haplotypes. 
but we could envision scaling that up depending on how much variation we're able to capture. And we're finding that if you replace a single haplotype now with a set of human haplotypes, it reduces these reference biases that I presented earlier because you can basically pick and choose. A patient comes into the clinic, maybe reference three is better for them, so I'm gonna align them to that reference instead of reference one. And there's ways to automate that in our bioinformatic processes that get rid of a lot of these mapping biases and just improve right away uh, even variant calling processes. And that yields immediate reduction in biases and improvement in alignment and variant calling accuracy. So we just published a, a pilot paper on this this summer, uh, a draft human pangenome reference that included just 48 initial samples that were sourced from the Thousand Genomes Project. And we particularly targeted ancestries of genomes that were underrepresented by current genetic studies and references. There's a huge untapped reservoir of genetic diversity in the African continent, and so over half of these initial samples were drawn from um, African individuals from the Thousand Genome Project. Um, these are all from cell lines. I mentioned this just for Peter as an apology. These are LCLs. They've already undergone VDJ recombination in a lot of cases, and so we don't have perfect recovery of the uh, native Ig haplotypes across these regions, uh, but it was a compromise we had to make to get this project up and running, and the Thousand Genomes resource is just a tremendous resource of these immortalized cell lines uh, that are banked at Coriel. And importantly, for the start of this project, we had access to trios. So we could sequence the parents and the offspring for all of these individuals, and that allows us to phase out the two haplotypes of each genome very accurately and completely. And so just to kind of give you a taste of how this might enable genome inference in the future, let's think back to those RH blood group antigens. And so I'm showing you kind of four um, haplotypes in this region that were taken from that list earlier. And those little squiggles in the middle are the pan-genome graph for this region. So it's all of that haplotypic diversity compressed into this graph type structure. And then each of these haplotypes is represented as a path through that graph, very similar to the genome assembly analogy I was giving earlier. So imagine you're this individual in the top right of the figure and you are RH negative. So I wanna analyze your genome, maybe I sequence you with long reads, I align those long reads to the pangenome graph and I notice that it follows this path on the bottom and it completely skips these top segments. Those top segments are these RHD genes. And so from a single nanopore read, I can kind of instantly genotype your haplogroup, okay, this is an RH negative, maybe I should pull out this locus and use it for the reference for mapping. And you can think about pushing this to the extreme. How short of the reads can we deal with? What's the minimum coverage that we can use to accurately infer the haplotypes of this individual without necessarily doing everything de novo? And so long read genome inference, I think, holds a lot of potential in the future for genotyping a lot of individuals, even in some of these complex structural regions of the genome. So my hope is in 2000, we had the draft sequence of the human genome. In 2010, we started getting long read sequencing and we're developing lots of new reference genomes. 2020, we have T to T genomes, but I hope in 2030, we can just drop all of the prefixes and everybody will just be diploid complete T to T genomes and we can just call them genomes. Um, I made this argument to Todd in microbial genomics 10 years ago and I think it's come true. People in microbial genomics just do genomes now. Uh, it's very easy and cheap to get complete microbial genomes and I don't think it's a stretch to say give us another 10 years and this will be the state of human genomics. So again, I made this exact pitch to you 10 years ago for microbial genomics and it's why we developed Parsnip as an aligner, because I said, Todd, nobody's gonna be mapping anymore. We're gonna do whole genome alignment for everything. I'm not very creative. I'm doing the same pitch 10 years later, but for the human genome, the future is complete genomes. And so my group has been working very hard on developing methods like the Virco assembler to make routine the de novo assembly of T to T genomes without any prior information. We're using it to make a rat T to T genome, hopefully, to aid Peter's work on model organisms and many, many other genomes, cats, dogs, horses, you name it. And at least for human, and in a lot of these important model organisms and agricultural species, we're going to use those T to T genomes to make these comprehensive pan-genome reference databases that I talked about as simply a collection of haplotypes from a diverse set of individuals. 
And my hope is that will then enable new methods that can do cheap and routine inference of T to T genomes. But we need to build up all of those prior probabilities first on variation that we expect to see. That will enable millions of complete T to T human genomes, and I hope that data set will enable the training of machine learning based annotation pipelines that will take your personalized diploid genome at birth, say here are all of your genes and here are all of the variants that we might need to be concerned about, and then let a clinician look at that data and uh, prescribe potential treatments if any diseases are predicted. And lastly, because you will have your own diploid personalized reference as part of your health record, that will enable accurate functional and somatic monitoring of your body over time. And so think about things like early cancer detection. We're looking for anomalies in your genome relative to what it was at birth. Aligning against your own reference will allow, allow a very precise detection of any of those genomic anomalies and hopefully early warning of cancers. And liquid biopsies you know, hold a lot of promise, I think. It's still early days, but there's a ton of startup companies being founded with the idea of take a little bit of blood from an individual, look at the cell-free DNA, and predict cancer risk. So what's new? Very simply, new sequence. We have 200 million bases of human sequence uncovered um, with the T2T project. It's nearly all segmental duplications in satellites. It's all repeats. But repeats are cool, and they're doing functional things. With the Human Pan Genome Project, we're replicating that now for many diploid human genomes. We currently have over 100 new haplotypes and counting. I'd like to see that up to about 1,000 complete T2T haplotypes from a diverse set of ancestries. And having all of this human haplotype recovered is uncovering this hidden variation in the genome. Uh, and these really interesting forms of variation, such as recombination and gene conversion, which can make large structural changes in the genome and allow much faster evolution than you could get with kind of a point mutation model in some of the more unique regions of the genome. So resources that I mentioned today are assembly software, Virco is freely available. It takes PacBio HiFi data and combines it with Oxford Nanopore data to generate, in a lot of cases, T to T chromosomes. Our complete reference is available from this link. We've recently finished the HG002 diploid benchmark assembly. This is used by the National Institute of Standards and Technology to measure the quality of uh, variant calling. We've now completed the complete diploid genome, so we can also measure the quality of genome inference going forward with this complete benchmark. Um, the Pan Genome Reference Consortium has all of the data available here. And then lastly, I briefly mentioned it, but we're also applying these methods to a whole bunch of non-human species. Um, uh, very shortly, we'll have a preprint up on all of the sex chromosomes for the great apes. Um, gorilla, chimpanzee, bonobo, uh, gibbon, orangutan, um, and so forth. And we're finishing now the T to T complete genomes for all of those uh, ape species. And that's going to allow really cool comparative genomics across um, those species that are separated by millions of years of evolution. And then to wrap up, um, just a huge thank you and acknowledgement to Karen Miga, who's co-led and co-founded the T2T Consortium with me and has really put the Pan Genome Consortium on her back and make sure that we're meeting our production deadlines with this project. And then all of the other faces are the current members of my lab that have contributed to this project. And then at the bottom, just a subsample of some of the T2T Consortium as we were celebrating in Santa Cruz last year for the completion of the CHM13 reference. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So I have a question for you on the, the how much, how many more haplotypes you think there are going to be? Yeah. So it's, you have 48, you said you want 100 and eventually 1,000. Is that based on predictions or like how many do you think there are? Yeah, it's, it's, again, one of these chicken and the egg uh, problems. Um, but we have a decent idea kind of from the initial 1,000 Genomes Project and some of these larger diversity studies um, of allele frequencies at kind of the single nucleotide level. It's a little fuzzier at the structural variation level because we don't know how many times you get kind of recurrent mutations of an inversion that doesn't fix. And so it might not be in linkage with the surrounding variants. Um, but we initially picked this 350 diploid individuals um, by some back of the envelope calculations that that would capture 99% of common variation that's present at at least 1% allele frequency in the 1,000 genome set. And so um, that'll capture the majority of common variation. The amount of rare variation, especially in Africa, is enormous. 
And so I, I think that would be really hard to pin down what we would need. Um, but there's a really cool study being led by Emer Kenny um, at, uh, in New York with this BioMe cohort. And so they've been recruiting and genotyping individuals from New York City, which is just this tremendous melting pot of genomic ancestries. And what we can do with that cohort is bring them in and genotype them very cheaply with even a chip or low coverage nanopore sequencing, and then check against the pan genome. Okay, which of these individuals are adding the most allelic diversity that we haven't seen yet? And so we're gonna, in the future years of this project, greedily select from that cohort until we start to saturate. And that'll be the real question is like, when does this uh, frequency curve really start to saturate? And then we'll know we have enough. Um, the other question is, you know, the common variation might be enough to just kind of infer the haplotype that I'm dealing with, and then you can call kind of de novo variation against that haplotype. So you don't really have to have all the variation that exists in the population in the graph, just enough that you can identify which haplotype you're dealing with and map the reads there and call the de novos or the rare variants. There is one element of genomic variation that you didn't touch upon at all, and those are the transposable elements. Sure. And those transposable elements may be playing a big role in phenotypic generation as a result primarily of influencing gene expression. So there are two more dimensions to this story, gene expression variation and uh, transposable elements that aren't incorporated in the big picture yet. Do you yeah. have any comments or insights you'd like to share with us on those? Yeah, thank you. Um, that is an oversight on my part. You know, there's a bunch of friends in the T2T &T consortium that all they think about is TEs, so they would just be offended that I haven't even mentioned the word transposable element. But some of it is trying to make these uh, uh, presentable to a general audience. So transposable elements, um, and maybe the reason that I don't mention them, is that they're easy uh, to assemble with long reads, and I care so much about assembly that tends to be where I, the lens that I look at all of this. Um, and in the human genome, you know, if we talk about like line elements and, and, and HERV uh, elements, they tend to cap out at you know, about 10,000 bases. So as soon as we got sequencing reads that are like 20,000 bases or 100,000 bases, they instantly became very easy to assemble and presented us no problems anymore for assembly. But obviously they have huge functional consequence in the genome. If you have a TE land in a regulatory region and change um, the accessibility or the uh, regulation of that gene. Um, from all of these haplotypes, characterizing kind of the fixed and common TE insertions will just be very easy, and we'll absolutely be able to do that. But I think maybe the more interesting question is about some of like the active TEs and maybe even somatic variation. And so some of my colleagues at NIH that think about uh, neurodegenerative diseases are very interested in potential reactivation of like HERV-K elements or other TEs that might be somatically variable in brain cells and leading to neurodegeneration or certain disease phenotypes, that becomes much harder. Because now you have to do single cell analyses and be sensitive to a single variant in a single cell or a small subpopulation of cells. And uh, that's where I would defer to folks like Fritz <laughs> that think a lot more about somatic structural variation. The catch is that we don't really know how to do single cell sequencing with long reads very well yet, because all of the single cell approaches require amplification and amplification introduces all kinds of artifacts that are kind of counter to long read uh, approaches. And so a lot of that somatic variation studies um, are currently doing bulk sequencing of a whole bunch of tissue and then look for like individual reads that show a unique TE insertion in the genome and try to back up from that. Um, there is this new uh, SMAT consortium, is that how you pronounce it, that the NIH Common Fund um, has recently funded that plans to go very, very deep looking at somatic variation with long reads and other approaches across all variety of human tissues. And having these complete references, I think, will be a great help. My small contribution to that consortium is pitching this paired reference idea that if you're looking for somatic variation in Peter, you should have Peter's reference genome to map against rather than a different reference. And so I think we are going to do that for a subset of these samples. Have you thought about allelic annotation in terms of population frequencies? Like that's one of the yeah. most crucial filters of ranking variants. And like, it's not so easy to lift over, as you know, variants from one genome to the other, but like it's such a valuable resource to have. Yeah, that's a great point. And you know, people that do uh, any kind of clinical genomics, you know, the resources like Nomad and so forth that give you allele frequency information. If you're looking for de novos in a genome, you have this needle and a haystack problem. And the first place to look is, okay, I've never seen this variant 
in the human population before, so this is probably the cause of the disease. Um, doing that from structural variation is tricky, um, but I think even just having these haplotypes assembled, like say we have a set of 1,000 haplotypes, you can do kind of what I was pitching for the RH and just say, all right, this patient has this haplogroup at this locus, and we will be able to annotate each of those haplotypes with allele frequencies. Like how exactly that's represented is the rub, but by just having them represented as uh, haplotypes like that, we could really say for any locus, what's the frequency of seeing this in these larger scale data sets and represent it that way. You could annotate it onto the graph, for instance. Um, but I don't think it's that hard of a problem because we've already done it um, ad hoc where I've done a patient's genome, I see an inversion, and now I wonder like, okay, how frequent is that inversion in the pan genome? And you can query the pan genome and check how many haplotypes have that inversion status, just looking for basically identical haplotype matches. But we do need a ton of tooling around that to make it possible for clinicians and others to ask those questions. Because right now, uh, dealing with graphs and the pan genome tools is just a headache even for the experts. And we have a, a bit of a road ahead of us to make it accessible to everybody. Would you be able to talk more about the recursive neural network? Is it uh, uh, long, short term? Is it just a recursive? How much yeah. computer, computing do you need to process all this data? It's not my area of expertise. I did not develop these algorithms, but I know enough to be dangerous. Um, and this is a very uh, abstract model being shown here. Um, as a lot of machine learning pipelines are, it's a conglomerate of multiple components. Um, my understanding of the latest models is that they are long, short-term memory architectures for the first part. And what the first part is trying to do is from um, this set of event transitions give a probability distribution across all of the camers for each of the events. So if what the LSTM is ultimately outputting is across, for instance, all of the five MERS that I could predict, what's the probability of those five MERS at this event? And then what I didn't say, but I'll, I'll mention now, is that because there's five bases in this example, resident in the poor at a time, and then it um, translocates by one base, each of these events overlaps by four bases. And so there's information there in that this next event, if this is indeed G, C, T, A, C, this next event should start with C, T, A, C, and then the question is what's the next base? And so you have to do this decoding ultimately at the end of the process. After you predict all of these Kamer probabilities, there's a decoding process that looks at all of those probabilities and tries to find the most likely set of Kamers that matches that constraint that they all have to overlap adjacent Kamers. And I can't remember off the top of my head what exact algorithm does that, but it's to look through all of those probability distributions and find that most likely reconstruction of Kamers. So that's my level of knowledge on how this works. It's a constantly evolving process, um, but they have made tremendous gains. The early methods to do this base calling, because it has this property of them kind of overlapping like this, and being contextual, we're all HMM-based models. Those quickly got replaced by the RNNs that started performing much better. And they have gone in the early days of Nanopore to a sequencing accuracy that was like 70 or 80% now to pushing 99%, all based on gains in the machine learning techniques that they're using. So there is a lot of overhead here, um, a lot of headroom for improvements just based on better algorithms. So they do invest quite a bit in, in this. Um, there's also a cool technique that they call duplex sequencing, which I didn't mention, where DNA is double-stranded, right? You're pulling it through the nanopore a strand at a time. If you pull the first strand through and then the second strand through, you've read the forward and reverse complement of the same double-stranded molecule. And so you can do base calling on the forward strand, base calling on the reverse strand, and then feed those probabilities into a joint model that looks at the forward and the reverse simultaneously and can use that complementary information to get even more accurate reads, now 99.9% .9 accurate in that case. And this works because it's different Kamers. The reverse complement of this would be GTAGC, which is a different Kamer than GCTAC. So it has a different current level. 
And so some of the k-mers have very similar current levels. For instance, this one and this one might be hard to differentiate, but that same sequence on the reverse complement might have a bigger differentiation. And so by looking at the forward and reverse strand jointly, you can make a really, really nice call uh, with that extra modeling. If you were advising you know, someone from TopMed or UKB or whatever on their data strategy, how would you think about reprocessing in the context of this new information in a potentially reference-free environment? Yeah. So um, given the, the draft pangenome that we have now, which is just 47 samples of, of lower quality, we're already going back to some of those cohorts and trying to recall them and see what extra juice we can squeeze from the rock of the short read data. Um, and the way that it works is that by mapping reads to the pangenome uh, graph with a mapper like giraffe, it came from Tobias Marshall's group and others, um, that solves a lot of the mapping bias problems. Like it can find the right haplotype to map to and copy number issues are resolved um, and the reads map to the right haplotype. And then you call the variants um, against the right haplotype project those variants back to HG38 so you're in like a common coordinate system. And that process of calling in the graph and projecting back to HG38 can reduce the number of false positives and false negatives by a big amount. I think it was like 30% or something reported in the paper. So by using a tool that's pangenome aware, you can get much more accurate variant calls. And if you kind of talk to, you know, the Illuminas or any of the people that do genotyping, they're already kind of doing this with their in-house tools. This is now an open resource that could allow other people to do it as well. Um, and so that's one way to get small variants at greater accuracy. Um, another interesting idea is with tools like Pangenie, also from Tobias's group, which is trying to do this inference or this imputation of SVs from short read mapping. So map short reads to the graph, and if you see short reads on a haplotype that contains an SV, you can kind of infer that this haplotype has this SV based on the other variants that are around it that you could assay with short reads. And so a tool like Pangini looks at the KMERS to infer SVs from short reads with the use of a pangenome. And that can get you a greater recall rate of SVs against a pangenome. So those are the approaches that people are currently taking to try to reanalyze short reads, and they seem to be bearing fruit so far.